Today is November the 27th, 2007. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with the OSU Library, and we're doing an oral history project called Women of the Oklahoma Legislature. And today I'm with Susan Paddock, who was elected to the Senate in 2004 from Ada, Oklahoma, District 13. That's right. Okay, thank you for allowing me to come today. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Let's start by having you tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you were born, and then we'll work forward. Okay, great. Uh, I grew up in Texas. Uh, in fact, I just have to throw this out here. Uh, when I was campaigning, I told everybody I was you know, a Texan, Texan by birth, but an Oklahoman by choice. And so a very conscious decision to cover the state of Oklahoma it was a great decision. Um, but growing up, uh, what can I tell you? I had uh, one sister. Uh, she's 10 years older, so I was the baby of the family. Uh, my dad was a telephone lineman for General Telephone Company, and he and my mom, when they were first married, and they married young, because that's what they did back in those days, uh, they traveled all around in a little trailer, and my dad was a telephone lineman. In fact, on my office wall, you'll see some climbers that were his when he retired. They gave him his climbers back when they climbed the poles. And it's kind of interesting because young people now don't know. They always just see the bucket trucks. But before there were bucket trucks, there were, trucks, there were people who climbed up those telephone poles. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and, and that was what my dad wanted her to do. And so with a, a sister 10 years older, she put me, uh, she tells me stories of when I was little, She'd ride her bicycle around, and she would put me in her basket, and she'd say the neighbors would just come out. I was a baby, and she rode with me in her basket of her bicycle, and the neighbors all were pretty horrified about that, but I guess my mom was okay, and she never dropped me, so that's a good thing. Um, but what do I remember about growing up? Oh, I just remember, you know, being outdoors. I like to do a lot of outdoors things. My dad would take me fishing, and we lived... Um, I was born in Baytown, Texas, but uh, spent most of my growing up years in a town called Robstown, which is close to Corpus Christi. And I can remember a lot of fun times. My, my dad really liked to boat, and we'd go to the lake, and I learned how to water ski. And he took me fishing one time on the Gulf of Mexico in one of those big boats that you kind of rent, and, you know, rent, and you pay to go out and go fishing. And I had like a bamboo pole, and I caught the biggest fish. And so I liked to fish a lot. I thought that was pretty fun. So grip of the water, really enjoy those outdoor activities. Was a Girl Scout brownie first and then a Girl Scout. Um, just, you know, my mom was the leader. Just remember doing a lot of things. Um, very family oriented, which is good. And then college? College. Well, before college, mm -hmm. my sophomore year in high school, we moved from Robstown to a town called Brownfield. And Brownfield is out in West Texas. Um, our grandmother lived in Leveland, and I can remember going there all growing up because from South Texas, it's very lush and tropical and, you know, nice trees and plants and everything. You can go to West Texas, it's very dry and very flat. And uh, we would go to uh, see my grandmother, and I'd say, oh, this West Texas. Well, I sure am glad we don't live here. Well, lo and behold, on my uh, sophomore year in high school, my dad got transferred, and we moved to Brownville out in West Texas. But um, I definitely believe that, you know, we have a, a destiny, a fate, a, a life plan that uh, our maker has for us. And uh, met a young boy named T. Gary Paddock when I moved to uh, Brownfield, Texas. He asked me out to, you know, to the movies and to go get a Coca-Cola. And uh, so I asked my friend Hazel, and been in town very many days, is this somebody that I would want to go out with? Because when you're new in town, you want to make sure you go with the right person. You don't want to go out with somebody who's not a reputable person so she said yeah he was okay so uh gary paddock of course and i dated and, and married um 1975 so it was one of those things i think supposed to be in west texas mm -hmm. uh college went my first few years in lubbock uh, texas tech university and because gary paddock and i were still dating and he was at the university of colorado he wanted me to go there and so i asked my parents and um, learned very early on that with my dad you better have a very good uh, case for whatever it is you want to do because he wasn't easily sold on anything. You had to say why this was beneficial and, and uh, I made him a deal. If, if he would let me go to University of Colorado, I would work and I would raise all my spending money and all he'd have to pay for was the schooling part, but anything additional. Well, 
he let me go. So I went to the University of Colorado my junior year. Um, Gary Paddock and I broke up, <laughs> which was kind of funny when I think back on it now, but that's okay because um, it was the first time I'd been away from home. It was really good for me. Uh, I might also add that I was the first one to get to go to college. My sister went to business school. There was such a gap in age. Um, as my dad kind of worked his way at the company, um, by the time I came along 10 years later, they were more able to afford my being able to go to college. And my sister was just able to go to business school. So um, I went to the University of Colorado, never been away from home, but I can remember my mother just going, oh, and now you've broken up and you're so far away from home. But it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned to be independent. I learned to take care of myself. Um, it was also actually a little more difficult school. And I had to study really hard and uh, I learned that I could succeed and made lots of new friends, people from all parts of the country. Um, I was in a sorority. I was the only girl uh, from the Southern part of this, uh, the United States. And it was so funny, back at that time there was a commercial on it was shake and bake and I helped. And my nickname became Shake for Shake and Bake because I had that Southern accent. So I'd be walking across campus and I'd hear somebody go, hey, Shake. So that was kind of fun. Um, you know, it's it funny the things you remember. But um, I did well in school, got my degree. Uh, my senior year, uh, Gary and I started getting back together. But I really had the opportunity to grow up and like I said, be self-sufficient and, and learn to be independent. So that was a, a very good thing. Um, so it was good to go away. Then I actually went back to Texas and taught school where I had gone to junior high. It was now the high school. Uh, excuse me. Where I went to high school, it was now the junior high. And so I went back and taught and um, then became engaged and got married uh, after I'd been out of college a year. And then worked in Texas for how long? And then I moved to Houston, Texas. And uh, Gary was in medical school and uh, worked there in Houston for two years. And he was out of medical school, and then we went to Denver, Colorado, uh, where I also taught school uh, at Littleton. And he was in his internship and residency, and we did a lot of fun things. We were very poor because you can't go through medical school, and two of you live on a teacher's salary. I think the first year that we were married, I made $9,000, which is not very much money to live on. Needless to say, he had to take out some loans and get a public health scholarship, which helped us uh, get through that time. But when we went to Denver, he was able um, to moonlight some, and he would work in the emergency rooms um, and gave us a little extra money, and that way we could go snow ski. And we snow skied, and we cross country and we backpacked, and we did all those wonderful outdoor things that you can do in Colorado, and fished some, too, because I like to fish. So we did all those kind of fun outdoor activities and just really had a good time. And then um, looked at, because he'd gone into a public health service, which is a, a federal program, and he decided to go into the Indian Health Service. And so we had a two-year payback, and we looked at the various openings, and there was a brand new hospital being built, um, the Carl Albert Indian Hospital in Ada, Oklahoma, brand new in July of 1980. And so we decided, well, you know, Oklahoma's pretty close to Texas. We'll go there, only intending to be there for two years, and then we would either go back to Texas or back to Colorado. Well, we just fell in love with Ada. You know, rolling hills, all the outdoor activities that we did in Colorado, we could do them around the Ada area, but there weren't all these people there. So you could actually go camping and somebody not trample across your, your campsite. And so we... Um, Made a lot of friends and just loved the area um, and uh, started our family. So our, our son was uh, born in 1981 and we just fell in love with the area and the people and just the quality of life. So after he did his two years there, we decided we'd make that home, which is what we did. So we've been there 27 years in Ada. You'll be there a few more, I'd say. <laughs> I'll be there forever. We built a home in 1994 and I said, this is it, not going anywhere else. So this is this is home forever. Well, how early on did, were you interested in politics or political you know, issues? That's interesting. Um, I will tell you, it is just a beautiful gift to be an elected official. Uh, it's a great, I, I tell everybody, it's a great season in my life. My kids are grown. Um, honestly, I would not have done this when my children were little. Um, it's pretty much a seven day a week job 
and I had this wonderful marriage of 32 years, and, and my husband is a great helper. And to really give what I think you need to be giving to the people of your district takes total commitment, and it takes just about every minute of your time. Um, so when did I get interested in politics? Oh, I guess I was always interested in politics, but while my husband was in medical school, I joined um, a medical alliance group, which is a physician spouse group. And, you know, we learned about all the things that were affecting uh, healthcare. And once you start knowing about the issues, it really compels you to get involved. So through the years, um, I was very involved. Gary and I were always what they called key contacts for the medical association, which meant there was an issue. They would contact us by fax because in back, back in the old days, it was always by fax, not by email like it is now. And they would do a blast fax and say, contact your legislator about this bill or that bill. And so we were always very active. Um, actually, I got even involved uh, through the political action committees. Um, the medical association had a PAC, uh, and they allowed physician spouses to be part of the PAC board. Um, also got involved in the National Medical Alliance Group and was president of that organization in the year 2000-2001, which took me to 32 states in Canada. Uh, and much of what I did was talking about health care issues. And the passion when you're a volunteer and you do something, I mean, obviously you do it out of your own, own money and your own time and energy, and you get very dedicated to that. So a lot of that energy and that knowledge and that training actually came from my volunteer work. Because as I was a part of this organization, before I was president, they would do speaker training with us and they would do leadership training with us and, and just all sorts of things that really helped me unbeknownst to me. I mean, at the time, I just enjoyed that. I enjoyed the challenge. I enjoyed thinking about new issues, but I was getting a lot of leadership training. I was getting a lot of really skill sets that once I decided to run for office helped me tremendously um, because I would go into a room with 200 people, not know anybody and, and have to do a presentation. Well, that's a skill set that's very useful to me now as I travel throughout my district and to know how to put a speech together um, and that sort of thing. Of course, in those days, you had a lot of time to prepare. At this point in time, I do so much speaking, I don't have time to prepare. You just kind of have to go for it. Uh, but, of course, I read all the time. Even when I'm exercising, uh, I, I catch up on newspapers. I get on the elliptical and I'll read five or six newspapers that are in my district. And that's how I keep up on issues and also what's going on right now during interim all the House studies, the Senate studies, I read the newspapers, and it keeps me uh, knowledgeable about what's going on. But So I've always kind of had that interest, and uh, we'd come and visit the Capitol. There would always be medicine day at the Capitol, and nobody else would want to go talk to the legislators. It's kind of like that commercial, you know, let Mike eat the cereal or whatever. It was always, let Susan go talk to the legislators. Nobody else wanted to. And uh, I guess I, people have, for some reason, almost a fear of elected officials. Like, they don't want to come talk to you or they think you're different. I mean, you're just the same person you always were. Um, you just have a little bit more responsibility uh, at this point, obviously. And, and, and a true gift to be able to help people to make a difference by passing good legislation, by doing constitutional work, that sort of thing. But a lot of people are not as comfortable coming and talking to legislators. But it never bothered me. I always went and talked to our legislators because I cared about the issues. And I guess that's really the bottom line why I ran for office is I cared about the issues. And in 2004 was a very unique time in our state. Okay. Um, in 2004, of course, that was the first year that term limits were going to uh, be in place. And so a third of the legislature was going to be gone. And because I've always been involved, not just in healthcare issues, but also during that time I worked, it was always in the educational field. So I was a teacher. I worked adjunct faculty at East Central University there in Ada. Uh, I worked for a group for many years called the Oklahoma Foundation for Excellence, started by David Bourne, with the, uh, the whole prime objective of, of promoting academic excellence. So I had this real passion for education in our state, too. And so in 2003, um, I started looking at the candidates that were going to be running. And I just, I just kind of had that, mm, that feeling that nobody would work as hard or care as much as I would. I mean, 
I just know when I do something, I give 110%. Um, and so, and that's what I wanted for our area, somebody that wake up every day going, how can I serve the people of this district? How can I make, help make good things happen? Because it's always a collective. You, you personally can't do it all. You have to have people that can help you and you have to work, uh, especially in this day and time, you have to work in collaboration and, and be a consensus builder. And I thought I brought those skill sets to the table. So I ran for office and what an amazing, an amazing process that is. We live in this democracy and we take it so for granted. I mean, every day you wake up and you get to do exactly what you want to do. You know, if you want to start your day in prayer, if you want to go have lunch with your friends, if you just go to work, you know, take time with your family, go to a ball game, whatever it is you do. And yet our country's at war right now. And we have people who are putting their lives on the line so that we have those pleasures every day to do the freedom, to do whatever it is we choose to do. And when I ran for office, I had just a very profound sense of what it means to be in a democracy. Because when you go out and you talk to people and you knock on their doors, you really find out what's important to them. And it's, it's so amazing. And people were so appreciative of someone that would come and knock on their door. And I knocked doors for seven months to the point I just was limping. Uh, it kind of wore me out. But six days a week for seven months, I, I knocked doors because I was really the underdog. There was really nobody that thought I had a chance. But I believed that I could get it done. And I just was so amazed at the people who came forward to help us. My husband was wonderful. He had blood blisters on his hand from putting in a... Uh, the big four by eight signs that you have to put in, driving those T-posts to, you know, hang those big four by eight signs on. And we just had people that would go knock doors with us. We had people, another group would go be in parades with us. And, you know, other groups that would just help us do different activities that we needed to do. And uh, it was just amazing. Our kids helped. Uh, what a remarkable, what a remarkable process democracy is. And I wish for everyone that they would have that experience. You know, to be a part of really trying to get the best government that we can have. I think that, don't you think that's kind of remarkable? I do. Um, so that's all we did. We worked hard. We got elected. Uh, and I say we because I could not have done it without the tremendous supporters. And I have to this day friends that just, just bless my life that I would never have known had I not have run for office. And and they're just like part of my family. I mean, there's some that are just, I mean, they're like my sisters and, and brothers because they're just always there. So even now, is it time to go do parades? What do we need to do to help you? And just great people that I wouldn't have had the pleasure of getting to know had I not have run for office. And I think the other thing about running for office is that you really put yourself completely out there. And I'm really interested in a lot of books on leadership. And uh, one called On Becoming a Leader uh, was one I remember that I particularly liked. And, and it talks about, you know, leadership is fully deploying all your skill sets. And I think for me, running for office was that full deployment of all my skill sets. And it's like, there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> Once you've gone through a campaign, and, and mine was pretty pretty tough, and at times very nasty because, you know, campaigns can be very negative. Um, and I think when you start edging ahead of the competition, that's when they get particularly negative is people trying to, to uh, suppress the voters, if you will, or make them not uh, believe in you anymore. So... When it gets really tough like that, you really are in touch with who you are and there's just a real sense of there's just no fear. I've put it all out there and uh, and I pray that whatever the outcome would be, that I would just be, you know, I would be gracious. That whatever it was, it wouldn't make me sad or, or you, you know, bitter or anything that I'd lost it. Whatever the outcome would be, I, I really truly believe that it would, it would be okay. And it was tough, but it was okay. 
Did you have a slogan? Did you have a slogan? I think my slogan was, she'll fight for us. And uh, you know what? I do fight for the people in my district. And I fight hard because the truth is, um, government is not as responsive to its citizens as it should be sometimes. And as a state senator, I have many opportunities to be advocate, an advocate for my people, to help them get through the bureaucracy, to help them get through the maze, um, to help them sometimes get the services that they don't even know how to access. So I do fight. I do fight. Now, I'm a nice fighter, not a physical fighter, and I'm not uh, anything but above board when I fight. But I do advocate and I don't give up. I'm very tenacious. I'm very persistent. Well, can you talk about election night a little? Election night. Well, there were several election nights because I had a primary, I had a runoff, and then I had a general. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, three, three elections, and everyone was uh, equally, I guess, exciting. Uh, the primary, there were three other opponents and myself. Uh, I came in with 38% of the vote. Uh, my opponent came in with 42% of the vote. And then, of course, the other two, I don't remember what their percentages were. So, had one month from the time of the primary to the runoff, and we worked so hard. We also ran out of money. And I think that's another true test of your character. Um, when you're spending about 20000 a week on a campaign, and you have no money left in the bank, and you have to call your banker up and say, I need you to cover me for a while, knowing that I'll make good, because we always paid our, you know, every payments, you know, our bills and everything on time. And um, it was scary that it was very scary. But you, you've invested too much. Other people have invested too much. You do not quit. You cannot quit. And you wouldn't want to elect somebody who was a quitter anyway. Mm -hmm. So you just dig in and, and and you just keep going. And so uh, probably the biggest relief, the biggest celebration, and it was just total euphoria, uh, was, was the runoff. Because in the runoff, I beat my opponent. I had 55% of the vote and he had 45%. So I had gone from 38% to 55. He'd gone from 42 to 45. I had worked so hard and so had all the people who had helped me. And it was just absolute excitement. Absolute excitement. I remember hugging my husband and we were all just kind of jumping up and down. Uh, my consultant, I think, who was helping me was almost just in disbelief because it, we, I mean, it was just pretty remarkable that we did this. And so... That was really the hardest part. Uh, the general was not um, as difficult um, because uh, that campaign really um, didn't have the people or the resources as much as I had, had generated. So uh, the big one was, was the runoff, and that was the really tough month when the campaign got very negative. And, and it's pretty much like a bomb falling every day. You just didn't know where it was going to come from. But um, And then, like I say, you run out of money. Uh, but then, uh, very close to to the time of the runoff, um, I, I, I got this surge of support again. And it was just kind of like just carried me over. So um, helped me to, to get the, the win and the runoff. So it was pretty exciting. You didn't swear it in, babe. Ah. <sighs> That was so special. I had probably 30 people who were my supporters who came up for swearing in. Um, and um, my husband and our son were here and we took a picture and um, it was just it was just a very humbling experience because uh, here are all these people who had done just what you'd done. They'd, they'd fought hard, they'd worked hard to win and and we were all up here and, and anxious and excited and just all the things that come, all the whole full range of emotions that come with um, just this new opportunity. And do you stay here in the, in the Oklahoma City area or do you commute back and forth? During session, um, I stay up here. Uh, it's just too hard the days, you know, when we're in committee meetings, gosh, I probably am up at five in the morning and reading bills and that sort of thing. And, you know, there are, there are, so many functions and, and 
so many things to do after hours. I mean, and if there's not, I stay up here at my desk and work till seven or eight because um, there's just so much to do. The volume I was not aware of volume of, of things to do. I mean, there there are days during session we may get as many as 200 emails. And so the volume is just huge. And so it's just you're always behind. And for someone who's a very type A personality, always likes to get things done, everything neat and tidy, all organized and finished, uh, that's the hard part. You can see my desk is a little messy because uh, you can't get it all done. And it's always a matter about prioritization. I mean, you have to be able to prioritize. You have to multitask. And that was the funny thing about the first year up here uh, is, there goes my phone. Uh, sorry. Uh, the first year I was up here, people would come in and talk, and you would always be going to the next committee meeting or some other thing that you had to do. And I learned very early to just say, come walk with me, because that would be the only amount of time you had is to, to, to march from your door to whatever committee meeting you were going to. And uh, I, I, I think about that now. Come walk with me. But that's all the time you had. And you have to be able to process. You have to be able to multitask. Um, you couldn't survive if you didn't. And uh, I think that first year I, I passed 11 bills my first year, first year. Um, which is number. which is a quite a few. Uh, there again, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty ambitious and fairly intense, but uh, 11 pieces of legislation. And it takes a lot of work to, to do a bill and a lot of education. And that's what I love, though. You learn something new every day. Um, every day you have a new challenge, a new, new something that you learn, and that's that's fun. Do you remember the first bill or your first experience debating a bill on the floor? Well, I remember I had a very ambitious bill, um, and it's called RX for, uh, Oklahoma. And when I was campaigning and I visited all the nutrition centers, I'm, I saw our senior citizens, and they either would bring little plastic bags or little uh, Tupperware type dishes and they put half their lunch in there and you know they're just so economical and they all talked about how they couldn't afford their their prescriptions and so I found out about this pilot program in Norman whereby they tapped into the pharmaceuticals have uh, programs and, and they're available but they're very labor intensive and so if you go to your physician they don't have the time to fill out all these papers and for every drug company, the paperwork's different. Well, this program in Norman, this pilot program, helped people fill out all the paperwork and they helped them tap into these programs that the, the pharmaceuticals have to give people that um, are uninsured or underinsured the ability to access their prescriptions. And so what we did is we took that program, put funding into it, and it went into all the community action agencies, and then they go out and help the citizens to, to get access to these um, medications. So it was a million dollar piece of legislation. I mean, that's a huge, a huge deal, I think, for a freshman. And what I remember is I have this radio interview and the um, interviewer said, so Senator Paddock, um, how does this bill become law? And I had the, I, 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 it's a good thing I didn't laugh, but it makes me laugh now because, you know, at that point, I really couldn't tell you how, how it became law. I only knew that the first step is it went to committee. If you got out of committee, you got you got to have it heard on the floor, and if you got it out of the floor, then it went over the house side, and you kind of lose control out of it for a little bit. But it turns out um, there was a house bill very similar, and so there was a house bill and there was a senate bill, and we ended up um, the representative and I discussed was it going to be a senate bill or house bill, and we each had certain things we wanted, and um, it turns out I felt very strongly about who should manage the 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 actual bill, you know, the implementation, and he had very strong views about some other things. So we ended up making a house bill, but it went through uh, the implementation process that I felt very strongly about. So it was a very nice compromise, and and that program's still in place. And what's so exciting is I was at um, a dinner recently in my district. We have a free medical clinic, and so this community action agency that serves that area comes down and helps people, and the director told me, we're just saving thousands of dollars for people who come to our free medical clinic uh, for the prescriptions. And it's just like, yay, you know, three years later, it's still making a difference. And that's that's the fun of, of being a legislator, is getting to put good programs in place that help people. So 
Uh, but that whole idea is how does it become law? And I'm like, ah. And I think my response was, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that as I, you know, I'm, I'm learning as I go. That's what I said. Instead of saying, I'm, I have no idea how it becomes law. I just said, I'm learning as I go, which was very true. Uh, and I learned and, and got it done. And what are some of the other 11 that you're most proud of? Oh, I, I have actually a bill that was very near and dear to my heart, which was in the second session. And this was an area that was totally, you know, I've run a lot of education bills, a lot of health care bills bills because those were, you know, my, my passion areas when I came to the Senate. Mm -hmm. But um, I've run some other bills that really were just leaps of faith, um, one of which was the Caitlin Wooten Act. And I don't know if you heard about it, but there was a 16-year-old um, young woman at Ada High who was abducted and she was murdered by her mother's former boyfriend. And he had been let out on bail. Uh, after he kidnapped the mother, he'd been let out on bail, even though he had some violent tendencies. And I just thought, you know, something's not right with our laws when we're not protecting people who, who are violent. Why are we letting them back out when they're, they're violent? And so I can kind of stuck my neck out there and said, you know, we need to change our laws. And there again, you learn as you go. I didn't realize at the time when I said that, that our bail laws are actually in the state constitution. <laughs> so um, it turned out to be a little bit more of a challenge than I thought, but um, there were some precedents in, in case law, and we were able to change and strengthen what I think are the bail laws in our state. And um, I heard of an instance recently um, in Durant where someone was in a similar situation, and... Uh, they evoked Caitlin's law, and, and, uh, and the gentleman did not get out on, on bail. Um, so, you know, there again, it's, it's pretty exciting to do things that keep people safe, that, that help people, you know, get the help they need, whether it's medicines or education. Um, so some really, I, I think, some good laws have been passed that I've been privileged to be a part of. Um, another one that I'm very pleased that's in that health education uh, arena is we have huge shortages of healthcare workers in our state. In six years or less, we're gonna be 3,000 nurses short, um, allied health professionals were short on, and uh, was able to pass a bill that uh, provides a, it's called a healthcare workforce resources center. So studying all the gaps, and now we're going about methodically trying to, trying to fill those gaps by increasing the pipeline, you know, providing educational training so that we can get more nurses. Because we found that like 57% of all students who apply are getting into nursing school, which means there's a lot of qualified applicants out there that because we don't have enough nursing faculty and that sort of thing, they're not getting into the pipeline. So that's what I mean when I say we've got to expand the pipeline. So uh, really some kind of exciting things. Well, are you a chair or co-chair of any committees? I am. Uh, and that's another really significant uh, change because of term limits. Um, I came in as vice chairman of, of Education Standing Committee, moved to chair of the Education Committee in year two, and then in year three, uh, because now the Senate is equally divided, which is historic. You know, we have an equally divided uh, Senate, uh, half Democrats, half Republicans. I uh, got to help be a part of the negotiating team that defined what shared leadership was for that. And it really worked well last session, so hopefully it will again this year. Of course, it's a campaign year, so that could be interesting uh, to see if it holds as well. But um, I am co-chair of the Senate Education Appropriations, uh, which is a huge responsibility. Uh, but what's happened because of term limits, you move much more quickly uh, into committee chairmanships and leadership positions and that sort of thing. Any women on, on some of those? Um, women, not, not actually, uh, women are involved in everything. Uh, it, now that we're split, uh, everybody is co-chair of a committee. Okay. So that's that's kind of the new the new thinking, uh, and and very very much a result of again of, of term limits. I think because in the years past. You had to be here for years and years and years. You know, the jug was, you know, they always told you to sit in the back row and keep your mouth closed. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. You better be able to hit the floor running. Has your office always been in here? 
No, my office actually was in the South Hall. Um, and I liked that because I overlooked the South parking lot and it's very scenic. I don't have any windows in this office, but uh, when we moved to the shared uh, agreement, part of the Part of the restructuring was that the Democrats got the North Hall and the, uh, uh, the Republicans got the South Hall. So I had to move from South to North. So that's how I ended it. But this is a great office too. So uh, this, all the offices are quite nice. So on a typical day, if you get here at 7 in the morning? No, no you said you got up at 5.30. Not necessarily here though. Right. Um, a typical day. A typical, a typical day. day. Oh my goodness. What is a typical day? <laughs> Uh, a typical day really varies. In session, uh, like I say, I, a lot of times I'll get up at five and I'll read bills before I come into committee meetings here. Um, essentially, the minute you hit the floor, there's going to be people lined up in your office. Um, so what I've learned is that I need to read and you know have that quiet reflection time. I better do it before I get to the Capitol because once I hit the door, there'll be people here. And um, first year, the, you know, the lobbyists and the agency heads and everybody learned, typically a lot of people will leave after lunch on Thursday if there's, if there's no session Thursday afternoon. Well, I would always use that time to catch up on phone calls and paperwork, and I would always stay here Thursday afternoon and not go home um, until late in the afternoon, like 5 o'clock, I'd head home. Well, pretty soon people started coming in because nobody else was around in the building much, and they would all come to my office. So... I still do that. I can't get out of here because there's always too much work to do. But a typical day is being in committee meetings. It's running bills on the floor. It's having meetings with, <clears throat> pardon me, with constituents. I have a lot of people come up from my district. Had a uh, urban uh, legislator in here, my co-chair, who's from Edmond. And one day we were in here having an education meeting and he was in here an hour and a half. We had the, the staff, the fiscal staff in here. We're just talking about budget submits or thing. And I think I probably had oh, four or five interruptions of people from the district. And he goes, Susan, I live in Edmond. You have more visitors in an hour and a half than I do in a whole session. So it's really great though. I mean, I love the fact that, that people back in the district come up here. So you might have a classroom of kids. You may have career tech students. You may have the home educators group up here. Um, I mean, you never know. A retired educated group. I mean, there's just a ton of groups that come up on a regular basis. And without calling them, <laughs> this is this is everyone's capital. I'm I'm glad that they they just come up. Usually on the, a lot of the scheduled days, you know they're coming. But you know, I always encourage them to come by the office. You know, you always have time for your constituents. That's who you work for. You better always have time for them, or you're you're not doing your job right. So. That's always a treat to have people come up, and, and it's nice to visit. And because I traveled statewide in a lot of my work uh, in education, you know, I have people from all over. They're not always necessarily from my district, but people will come by and say hi. So it's always nice. But it, it makes for a very chaotic day. And then about 5 o'clock, it gets quiet around here. A lot of people head to receptions or other events that they've got to go to. Uh, I will stay usually, try and catch up on a few more emails, a few more phone calls, organize papers, load up my briefcase for all the reading I've got to do that night and the next morning, and, and then you start all over again. So I don't know if there is a typical day, but uh, it's always busy. No time for cooking. No time for cooking, that's for sure, <laughs> except on holidays. Well, do you drive down Lincoln Boulevard to get here? I do. I do. I do. 23rd's a little harder to get off of the freeway. So I was and props when you see the dome. You know, I still get excited. I still get excited. It's kind of like, oh, goody, look what I get to go do today. I get to go to work, and wow, I'm a legislator. And uh, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's exciting. It's just a huge honor and truly a blessing. As I said, it's, it's a truly grand season in my life. A time when since my kids are grown and I have this wonderful husband that supports me, I can really devote all my energies and time to to doing my job for the people. And you can gear up for re election for this year. You know, I will gear up, but I'm out every weekend. Uh, I'm out all the time uh, in my district. Um I talk to people, I have meetings, you know, during interim, I'm meeting with one group after another. 
I'm out at the pie suppers. Um, I'm just, I'm, at, I'm everywhere. Uh, put on a lot of miles. I put in, what, 2,500 to 3,000 miles a month on my car. So I'm everywhere. Uh, I think one, one Saturday night I hit about four different events. So you just go from one thing to another. It's it's tough not to put on a weight with so many good pie suppers and catfish fries and uh, all that sort of good thing. But uh, lots of nice folks in the district. And, uh, you know, at this point, it's it's kind of like going to family reunion when you go out to a lot of these events. It's just you like visiting with people and you like giving them a hug and you like seeing how the kids have grown and, you know, talk about who's feeling, you know, poorly because sometimes there's health issues. I mean, you just talk about, they are, they're just, they're like family and they're, you know, just good friends. They've become a really vital and integral part of your life. Um, they are your family. That's who you serve. Well, a little bit related to that. Do you have a role model? I do. Um, and it's interesting you would ask that, and, and I'm surprised I didn't mention her sooner. And um, for me, when I um, was a young mother, and, you know, I stayed home with my children for a few years when they were little, and uh, we had a senator named Billy Floyd, who you inter interviewed, and Billy was one of the first people I went to talk to when I decided I was going to run. And it's so funny, I can remember sitting at this restaurant, and I didn't know her very well at the time, but I'd always read about her. And for me, she was indeed the model of what a legislator was supposed to be. Somebody who was out there all the time, you know, cared about the people, accessible, I mean, she's like the Energizer Bunny. She still is the Energizer Bunny. And she's everywhere and she does everything. And I still, I just love her to death. And I call her every week because she still loves to hear all the, the stories. And she's such a good friend and such a good mentor. But she really probably never knows how many lives she affected through her, just through the way that she served the people of District 13. Um, she was a tremendous role model for me then as she is now because she continues to give so much to the people of the district and contribute so much and is so active in everything. I mean, that's definitely who I want to be when I when I grow up. I want to be just like her. So she's awesome. I hope that in some small way that some people see me that way. And I think maybe they do. Uh, it's also a little bit of a heavy burden because it's like, oh my gosh, people watch and, you know, you want to do everything right because you want to be a positive role model. But um, Billy Floyd really continues to be just a vital citizen and uh, a good friend. And, and the truth is my family probably gets at some point a little tired of all the all the politics and all that stuff. But Billy always loves to listen. And um, and that's that's really special to have a friend like that. Well, once you were here in, in this building, did you have someone that would take you under under their wing and show you a few of the ropes? Or You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure that we do as good a job as we should in nurturing our new people. That's good work. Um, I had a group. There were four other Democrats besides me who were elected at the same time and they called us the five amigos. And so, and they're all guys and I was the only female, but they called us the five amigos cause we went everywhere together. You know, we went to all the receptions. We did all the things together. We went out to dinner together. We learned together, but it was so great to have other people who came in cause we could talk to each other and we could talk about issues and we learned from each other. And for us, it was a great thing. It was a great thing to have that. Very necessary the first year. And I'm not so sure that we shouldn't somehow just structure that every time we bring in new legislators. And actually, because we're bringing in so many new ones because of term limits, that kind of naturally occurs. Even the 06 group, uh, they, the four of them really bonded when they came in. Um, I can't speak as much on the, on the, the Republican side, but... And for me, that freshman year was the Five Amigos, and that was a great thing. But I'm not so sure we don't need to really 
do a better proactive job, if you will, of, of nurturing our new people. And there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, I was reading in uh, U.S. News and World Report about they've just selected 18 top leaders and there's a discussion about the new thinking on leadership and that sort of thing. And I think I think you have to grow your leaders and I think you have to grow people into the positions of responsibility that we're in. And I think there's some skill sets that we could all help each other with because we learn from each other. Have you noticed any gender differences? Gender differences. Well, that is interesting. Um, even in the year 2007 that we would even talk about gender issues. Mm-hmm. Um, the truth is there, there are gender issues uh, always. I think we'll fight that for a while. Look at our numbers. We, we have seven senators that are women out of 48. Uh, even lower percentage in the House. Um, but when I ran, somebody asked me, is this like a woman thing with you? And I said, no, this is like a credibility thing. I said, it's never about the gender. It's always about the credibility. And frankly, I still take that approach. I don't, I don't address the gender issue. I just work through the gender issue. You know, if, I, if I'm dependable, if I'm reliable, if I know my stuff, if I do my work, and I always do my work, and I always, you know, stay informed, um, then I'll be credible. And um, so then I don't have to worry about the gender issue. But you have to be credible. You have to be hardworking. I mean, you just do. But don't you want that for every elected official? So be working hard and being credible and doing, doing the work they need to do. So that's the approach that I take. It's not about the gender. It's just about what you're willing to work. And work ethic was was one of the big things my dad taught me. So, What about the after the hours of the social aspect of it? Some of the women have said that, well, I mean, I know men go out to dinner a lot together and discuss the issues, and the women don't necessarily feel comfortable joining them. Or, I don't, I don't know, some do, some don't, I guess. I think that's changed. I think that's changed somewhat. I do know that first year, uh, because the Five Amigo group, and we always hang out together, and, and there was one evening, uh, one of the Amigos said, well, we're going out to you know dinner at such and such. Well, I don't have that on my calendar. Well, it's for all the freshmen. And so he said, go ask Senator over there. So I went and asked the senator over there, and I said, well, you know, I understand there's a dinner tonight. And he looked at me, and he goes, well, mm, it's not for all the freshmen. And it's at that point I realized, oh, I think maybe this was just the guys. And I said, oh, that's okay. I don't, I, I'm not trying to intrude. It's, it's totally, cool. oh, it won't hurt. You can go. And so that night, I think I went out to dinner with about, I don't know, seven, eight guys, um, and I guess I didn't embarrass myself or didn't embarrass them because I can invite it back another time or two. But um, it, it was funny. I do remember going home that night and calling my husband and going, well, I had dinner with the guys tonight. So I guess I guess I'm OK, you know, because you, you, you want to be treated and accepted as an equal always. Well, uh, Hannah Atkins had breakfast with the guys. So it has come a long way since. There you go. There <laughs> you go. That's a good thing. Yeah. It's it's been interesting to, to see how the different ages from the sixties, seventies and uh uh-huh. have, have answered that question. Well, well Billy Floyd even tells stories of when she got here there weren't any female bathrooms close to the to mm-hmm. the Senate floor. So yeah, things things are making progress. Well, when you were coming in you had certain goals and certain issues you wanted to address. Have you have you done most of those? You know, goals are, are should always be ongoing. Right. Uh, if you ever get to the point where you achieve all your goals, you're just not pushing yourself hard enough. So, have I achieved goals? I've achieved a lot of goals. Eleven um, bills, I think. Actually, I in in three sessions, I passed over thirty bills. So, I am learning every year. I am I am always pushing legislation. Uh, it's it's that time again this year, so I'm looking at all the things that I want to do, and I typically will take on. I, I ran a water bill last year, and water is one of those issues nobody wants to talk about. It's one of our most critical um, issues that we need to deal with as a state, and and those tough issues people want to just bury. They don't want to they don't want to deal with them, and I see myself as somebody who wants to to push it. I want to I want to push it because we can't. We can't be complacent. We can't be happy with what we have. We need to always be pushing 
to get to the economic prosperity we need in this day. You know, our per capita income is not where it needs to be. Uh, it's lower than a lot of other states. You know, we don't have near the number of college graduates that we need. Right now, I've been to two meetings in the past two days. The big issue is workforce. We need more educated workforce. We need to be tackling the tough issues in the state. That's how we, that's how we achieve prosperity in the second 100 years. We've got to be tackling the tough issues. So I'm, I'm comfortable with my role. Uh, some of those things will get shot down and I'm okay, but this year I'm going to bring back two water bills and see and see how those fare. Uh, and I'll bring back some bills. I, I had a bill last year. I couldn't believe it didn't get, even get heard on the House. It was to increase the penalty for wearing a seatbelt. And this bill came to me from an Ada Hyde leadership group. Uh, they had done some research and they have this big project that's got national recognition. It's called Project Ignition. It gets kids to buckle up their seatbelts and to drive more safely. And they brought this issue to me that, you know, they thought that our penalties needed to be uh, increased. Well, our penalties in the state are $20. And, and nationally, they're at about $38. So I ran a bill to, to, you know, increase the penalty. Well, during the course of that, as I told you, you always learn, I learned that we were missing out on $2 million from the federal government on, you know, public safety issues that we could be capturing if we'd raise our penalty to at least $25. It didn't get hurt in the house. So that's one of those that I will bring back this year. It's amazing some of the times the things that, that just get killed. I had another one. You know how we're always hearing about people leaving their children in a car and and they have serious, sometimes they die, serious illness or uh, die from being left in the car. And we heard about one recently. Somebody was at uh, a casino, left their grandchild in the car. And I had a bill that would, would have set penalties for that. That one didn't get hurt in the house last year. So... It was interesting. I had 18 bills pass out of the Senate last year, but probably only four of those survived in the House. Now, probably another four ended up, I put them in other bills of similar title, but they don't have my name on them. But uh, primary author, I, I think I've got about 31 bills in three sessions. So I'm always working very hard um, to, meet, to meet goals. And more importantly, uh, to meet the needs of constituents, because a lot of times those, a lot of my bills come from my constituents. Um, and their needs. So those are the best ones. Do you do your own research? We have, we have staff that helps us on the research. There's just there's not enough hours in the day to do all the research you need to do. Yeah, not to read. You have to be a speed reader. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. You learn. What has been your biggest obstacle, or, or have you had an obstacle? My biggest obstacle, um, I would just have to say, too much work and never enough time is, is, is an obstacle that uh, just not getting to do everything you want to be able to do in a day. Uh, but I do fit as much as I can and do every day. Do you have a favorite campaign story? A favorite campaign story? Well, I, I told this actually the other day. Uh, I talked uh, uh, at East Central uh, to a group about public service as a career. And I told the story, and I've told this several times because it kind of goes back to that gender thing. Um, there was an elderly gentleman who uh, lived close to the college. We had knocked his door once. My husband knocked it. The second time around, I knocked it. And he told me that he couldn't vote for me because I was a woman. And at that point, we'd knocked a lot of doors, and you kind of learned to put your toe kind of in, in the door there so they can't completely shut it. And so I kind of engaged him and I said, well, I think you might want to give me, you know, a, a second chance. He said, well, why is that? I said, well, you know, my daddy raised me to, to, to think and to work hard. And I said, you know, my husband knocked your door last time. I knocked your door this time. I said, is there anybody else coming around asking you, you know, if they can work for you? He said, no. I said, well, that's why I think, you know, you might want to consider voting for me because I will work hard for you. And so we ended up having a really nice conversation. And, you know, he was talking about his health and he was headed to church that night and that sort of thing. But, you know, the bottom line is uh, it was a little bit of a surprise uh, that, that he actually came out and said, I can't vote for you because you're a woman. And uh, but yet at that point in the campaign, it really didn't faze me because I believed in myself and I believed in what I was doing. And, and that's why I said, well, you know, I think in this, this case, you might want to, you know, give it a second thought or make an exception or whatever the exact words I said to him. But I wasn't shy on 
tell him, you know what, who else is, who else is coming knocking on your door? And, and so I think it didn't make an impression. So you'll go knock on his door again. There you go. Yeah, this time. Let me switch tapes there real quick, real quick while we have a good stopping point. Okay. Do you have a, 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 since we were talking about favorite stories, do you have a favorite one dealing with actually serving? Favorite story. Gosh, there's just so many wonderful experiences. I mean, you know, one day you may be going out and looking at bridges and another day, you know, you may be speaking to a group. Um, I don't know if I could really single out, but I, I love the diversity. Um, you know, if you talk core values, I mean, one of the things that I value is just the ability to challenge yourself on a daily basis, the ability to learn something new. And in this job, you always do. You always learn something new. Um, so I really like the diversity of things from going out. Uh, I can remember going out one time and uh, uh, going on, this, there's a sportsman's caucus. And I went out with the sportsman's caucus and uh, we went out on a coon hunt, you know. Yeah which is something very big in my area. Uh, and, you know, it, it was very interesting because uh, I didn't know what all that, that entailed. And then another day you might be going out and looking at sinkholes on somebody's property or um, you might be talking to somebody that, that needs help, you know, with their DHS and their grandchildren. I mean, it's just, I love, I love the diversity. Well, after your 12 years are up, what do you think your next step will be? Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, I think what I've always tried to do, just like with this opportunity of running for office, is, and I think it's very typical with, with today's thinking, is I keep my skill sets up. Mm -hmm. And I think I've been so blessed throughout my life. Um, doors just seem to open. There just seems to be endless opportunities if you like to learn if you like to work hard uh, if you're blessed with wonderful friends uh, there's just so many opportunities I, I guess that's my biggest challenge i want to always be a part of everything so uh one of the things i continue to do even now um is i do some nonprofit consulting on the side um you know most lawmakers do something okay. whether it's insurance or law or whatever um, and because of all my nonprofit work, uh, I continue to do nonprofit consulting. And I love that. I love that because uh, it's just limitless possibility and it's such a quality of life issue. When you think about what our nonprofits do for us uh, in our communities and in our state and in our nation, it's just a real quality of life, whether they're helping uh, rebuild homes for the elderly or they're helping children to learn to read, whatever it is. Um, there's just tremendous energy in that nonprofit sector. So I continue to do some consulting there and I enjoy that. I could see myself doing that more full time at the end of my 12 years. And I hope, I hope the people will give me 12 years. Um, but I don't know. There's, you know, all sorts of other things that may come along. And I, um, somebody asked, oh, do you, they asked me the question, so do you have aspirations to, to move on to the federal level? And I really don't think that I do, but I've learned never to say never because who would have ever thought I'd be a state senator now? I mean, I didn't really 10 years ago say, gee, I want to grow up in 10 years and, and be a state senator. But that that opportunity came. Um, and I think I think it's just fun to have the the courage to to walk through those new doors. I think that's what makes life interesting and fun is new challenges, new opportunities. And and just continuing to grow your skill sets and, and uh, continually to push yourself. That, isn't that what keeps you young? It's just that whole learning and, and growing and, and taking on new tasks. Perhaps you'll do a leadership class. That, that would be uh, fun. That would be really fun. I, I really am very intrigued with leadership. I, I just think we need to help people to be leaders. And I was doing some reading, like I said, the other night. And just find that very intriguing. Well, if, you, if some young woman came up to you and asked what you or your advice would be to her if she was considering running, what would you have to say to her? You know, I have had a young woman who was in a very good job who thought about running for public office. 
And she asked me an opinion. And if you ask me an opinion, I will give you an honest opinion. Um, she, very talented, very intelligent, obviously going to move up in, in, in her career. Uh, had lots of opportunity to move up uh, where she was. Um, had only been married probably seven, maybe seven years. No children. And she wanted to know what I thought about her running for office. And I said, well, you would be great. But I said, you're young enough that you're going to have lots of opportunities in life and you don't have to, you don't have to fit them all in in the next decade. I said, if you want to have children, you know, um, if you want to have a little bit more time right now with your spouse, um, I would advise that you wait and think about running for office later on because you're going to continue to move up in your career but you need to have time for your husband because seven years is not married for very long. And if you want to have children, I couldn't do this job if I had babies. I couldn't do it if I had toddlers. Now, there's some women that have done it out here, and I just applaud them. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. And, and she asked my opinion, so <laughs> I gave her an opinion, knowing that she would do whatever she wanted to do. But I think young women sometimes think that you have to do it all right now. And I think the wisdom of being a little bit older, like I am, is that, you know what, life is always full of opportunities and you don't have to cram them all in the next five to seven years. Pace yourself, you know, do what you want to do now and then know, set these other goals for yourself later on. But it doesn't all have to be done now. And I, I do think there's a tendency with, with all of us as we're young, we've got to do it all now. And I, I just think there's there's a season in life to lots of things. And so, but there's that's a whole career philosophy for some women. They'd rather have their career and put postpone, you know, having children until later in life. And some do it younger and then have their careers later in life. You have to, and, and I also said that, you have to find what works with you with for you and your you and your spouse you have to you know talk about these issues and put it out there um but i think it'd be very difficult to do this job to do the energy level that i have now would be very difficult to do with younger children even harder if you're having to commute or you live exactly away from them. i mean there are young women out here that do that i i i really applaud them i think it'd be tough The other thing that we were, that they asked me to ask too, maybe I'm not going to ask because I don't like the question, so let's skip it. Okay. <laughs> uh, here, I did the Forget Me Not, oh, that was the, the Forget Me Not Vehicle Safety Act was the one. Yeah. Not leaving them in the, in the car. Right, right, right. I talked about that. You talked about that. And the other one was, um, oh, you were on the 50 Making a Difference. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Um, the Journal Record um, is the Oklahoma City newspaper, and every year they select 50 women making a difference. Women, okay. It's all women. Uh huh. And um, I guess it's been about three years now. Uh, someone nominated me, and I was chosen as one of those 50, and I was very honored by that. Um, certainly, no one does volunteer work or works in their career or whatever. You don't do it for the the awards or the recognition. But, you know, it's always nice to be appreciated that somebody has noticed that you're trying to work hard and make a difference in your state. So um, I was very honored and very pleased to receive that. Well, if you don't have anything else, my last question. Okay. I can add something else. But my last question okay. is, when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? You know, if you if you really adhere to the whole good to great uh, philosophy of leadership, it's not important that I'm remembered for this bill or that bill, and I don't need roads or bridges or anything named for me. What I would what I would hope that people would remember about me that she worked hard, she cared about the people. And that would be enough because, you know, the true legacy I would leave would be that things are better. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if my name's attached. That's not the important part. The important part 
is that I did my contribution. And that whole good to great philosophy is it's not about me. Because the credit goes to all those around you. Because in this environment, you do nothing by yourself. You have to be a team player. You get no legislation passed if you don't have the votes for it. And so I just think it's important. And especially in this environment, there are some who it is about their personal credit or whatever. I, I really don't care about that. I, I mean, I would really just hope that people remember that she cared and she worked hard and she gave her best. Because what else is there? You know, and uh, that's what I would hope to leave. Yeah, I think you've done just that. I forgot the other question. Oh, okay. <laughs> that one makes me kind of tear up. <laughs> that was very good. Uh, you were the majority whip. Yes. And the first freshman big Democrat. First, first oh, I, I presided. I yeah. presided. Uh, because I had, and, 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 and this is really the truth, because I had such a difficult campaign, very difficult campaign, which we've talked about, um, and because I had to raise a lot of money, I had one of only six uh, Senate races that year that went over $200,000 in expenditures. Um there is a there is a tribute really that comes with that, and that is that you have the opportunity to be part of the leadership. Um, and so my freshman year, I was the majority whip, which means I was part of the leadership team. Um, I guess that year I was probably the only female, wasn't I? Yeah, I was the only female on the leadership team. Um, I think probably. When that happens, there are some who've been here longer who wonder why, but I really think it was a tribute to the fact that I had such a hard campaign and that I had proven myself uh, worthy uh, of being considered for leadership. And um, so I was the majority whip the first two years. Uh, this year I'm called the Democratic whip because now that we're in this 24-24 tie, um, there's there are the Democratic whips and there's the Republican whips. And actually this year we have three. Uh, a lot of people don't know what a whip does. And um, the whip is actually the person who goes around and asks the caucus members how they'd be voting on issues and issues that are very tight that we need to know where our caucus members are. Um, typically, the whip is the one that goes around. Now, a true whip probably goes as so far as to say that if you're not where you need to be on that vote, they'll probably try and twist your arm. And I was not that way, not that way now. We don't typically do that. Our caucus is very respectful of the fact that you need to vote your constituency and your core values. And I really value that as part of our caucus, that, that everybody, um, you know, values. They value each other and the fact that you have different constituencies and different stands on issues. So we may not all agree, but a true whip would probably... Um, um, help you to decide <laughs> that you need to be here or there on the vote. Uh, I probably at the federal level of WIP is, is a little more uh, persuasive in that regard. But at the at the state level, it's more just to, to really ascertain from other caucus members where they stand on issues so that we know there aren't any surprises. You know where everybody stands on issues. Well, if there's three this year, are there any other women? Yes, there are. That's a, yeah, that's a balance the other way. Then. There you go. So, yeah, yeah, we got a couple of people in leadership, a couple of women in leadership now. So, well, that's all my questions. I greatly yeah, appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been a pleasure.